Many Christians assume that they will never experience consistent victory over sin. We are conditioned to believe that real transformation, authentic transformation, continuing transformation is not something we should expect. You might experience some incremental improvement, but don't set your expectations too high. The problem is that the Bible portrays the Christian life in very different terms. 2 Peter 1.3, for example, says that God's divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. So if we ask, is real change possible? The Bible's answer is a resounding yes, absolutely. That's the point. So in this video, we'll talk about two things. We'll talk about what that transformation looks like, and then we'll talk about how that transformation happens. Continuing to reflect on 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, we get an ex a portrayal of the transformation that grace is supposed to accomplish in the lives of believers. Uh, Peter explains that in a movement away from corruption and towards virtue. He assumes that we come into the world uh, as corrupt people, focused on uh, ourselves, marked by lust, this self-oriented, self-focused, I'm going to have my way no matter what, no matter who gets hurt. We've all experienced the pain and the brokenness that comes when people behave that way. We, we know what it feels like. Uh, to be the victims of deception, and we know what it feels like to hurt other people because of our own sin. We know what that's like. Peter, however, wants to see a transition. He wants to see a transformation, a transformation based on God's grace from self-oriented, self-focused, self-driven lustfulness and corruption to godliness, virtue, self-control, love, mutual affection, and ultimately, fruitfulness. For Peter, the Christian life is a movement from self-ambition and vanity to a life of fruitful, self-giving love. That's the real change that is supposed to characterize the normal Christian life. But how do we get there? How does that change take place? Well, continuing to think about 2 Peter chapter 1, we get two words that get at the same crucial idea. One is knowledge of God, and second is participation in the divine nature. So uh, God gives knowledge of himself as a means of living in godliness. You need to know God so that you can live in godliness, and that happens through this idea of participation. Right? Participation is about how we relate to God in Christ, and at the heart of this uh, is the incarnation that God uh, has descended, condescended to become one of us in Jesus. God has become fully human uh, and relates to us in that way so that we can be made participants in the divine nature. That doesn't mean we become gods of some sort. It doesn't mean that our, our being or essence is sort of transferred from creature to uncreated God or something like that. That's not the idea here. This is about character. The whole content, uh, the whole context of this passage helps us understand that when, when Peter talks about participation in the divine nature, he's talking about sharing God's character. Everything for life and godliness has been given to us through God's power, his divine power, his gracious power. That's what Peter wants to see happen in the lives of believers. And so there's this deep relatedness to God that is crucial for that. This uh, has analogies in all of life. I mean, parents, take a moment to think about how you want your kids to hang out with good influences because we know we become like the kind of people we spend time with. We want to relate to Jesus, draw near to Jesus, know Jesus, walk with Jesus. And the consequence of that is that his character will be reproduced in us. He's given us everything we need for life and godliness, because he's given us himself. So my hope for you is that this reflection will help you draw nearer to Jesus. And as you draw nearer to Jesus, you'll see his character, his godliness, his holiness, his perfect love 
come to overflow in your life.